Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get started here. Um, my name is Chris von Simpson, and I'm the VP of Market Engagement for MicroStrategy. And it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, this this morning's first, I suppose, just about this afternoon's first fantastic speaking team. Uh, this is the team made up of uh, people from PetSmart, most particularly Dan, who's down there, looking forward to his demo, and Brian, who you saw in the keynote. And also the fantastic team from Data Meaning, who worked with them very closely on a lot of what you're going to see here today. So I'll get out of the way and let them get presented, but please welcome them here to the stage. Good afternoon. I hate to be between you and lunch. So uh, let's get uh, into this. PetSmart, over the last year or so, has uh, undergone a great deal of change. In about uh, May of 2014, lost about... Uh, 15% of its market cap, which led to uh, a, a uh, uh, triggered a search for a buyer to take us private. And so there was a lot of activity around reporting and what it would take to build, build an omni channel and all of these other things that was, uh, felt like were missing in the business. And so uh, that culminated in a uh, an acquisition that uh, was finalized in March. PetSmart is now a private organization. And we brought in a new executive team that uh, you know, it includes a new uh, CEO, a new chief experience officer, and so on. So we've got a brand new senior leadership team who is very focused on uh, driving consumer insights and uh, 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 using data to drive the business forward in a way that PetSmart has not traditionally done. So let's go through a few fun facts about uh, uh, PetSmart, see if you guys have any sense of what uh, might be the top selling item at PetSmart. And we have prizes. There are, right here. <laughs> Dog food. Dog food, <laughs> cat food. Goldfish. 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 Oh, okay. Uh, Boys, what's that? Toilets for pets. Look, you know what? It's amazing how much people spend on Halloween. So, uh, uh, but uh, let's go on to the answer, which will surprise all of us. 250 million crickets a year get sold by PetSmart. So, next question. We have, how many pet adoptions did we facilitate last year? You may know that we've got a nonprofit arm to uh, the organization called PetSmart Charities. How many did we? Uh, how many adoptions did we facilitate last year? Any idea? In, in the USA. In the USA, yeah. Uh, up in front. Yes. yes. Sorry. In blue. Did you guess? No. Half a million. Half a million. Right there. on. What? Right on. What yeah. does he guess? Which one? Did we, did we uh, stratify? Well, he got it right on the point, so he can yeah, choose. Yeah, 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 we'll come back afterwards. That's the point. <laughs> and actually, to date, we have over 6 million adoptions that we've done. So. How many tons of dog and cat food do we sell on an average day? That's a lot. <laughs> a lot, exactly. So, any guesses? 100,000. 100,000 tons a day? Let's we wish. <laughs> a little lower. A little lower. Okay, this is not as impressive, but yeah. Yeah. Five tons. Five, 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 five tons. Let's see. What's what is it? Two thousand tons per day on average. Five thousand on Black Friday. Five, Who came uh, the closest? So at a ton of, of a little, little over a ton per store per day. So we go through a lot of dog. Not the top selling item because that's the spot for crickets, of course. Uh, Which, by the way, we have to exclude out of lots of analysis because it just swings <laughs> units per transaction and everything off, else off. So. so it's amazing. So, of course, uh, you know, what BI slide doesn't give the gratuitous nod to Peter Drucker, right? So what's measured improves. Our executive team is very focused on uh, driving this business forward. And the way to do that is to be very clear about what are the strategies, what are the measures that help us you know, uh, uh, determine how well we're achieving those objectives. And so our, our CEO came in and said, I want a balanced scorecard in, in uh, the company. And by the way, here's the tool I want you to use. And I looked at Dan and I said, wait a minute, can't we use MicroStrategy to do something like this? 
This is not rocket science here. And uh, so we ended up sort of suggesting a microstrategy as a way to do that. There were still other people who wanted to look at a number of other very specifically oriented balanced scorecard tools. And uh, Dan and I looked at each other and we sort of said, you know, I, we don't want to lose this battle and we're not going to, by the way. So balanced scorecard is really about defining and refining the strategy for the company and uh, have the, some very specific measurable goals that help us determine whether or not we're meeting those objectives. So there are four perspectives uh, that are typically associated with the Norton Kaplan Balanced Scorecard. And uh, they are sort of learning and growth and internal processes and financial goals. Well, uh, there was a lot of debate internally, not only around tools, but around, well, what is a balanced scorecard and what does it really mean? Well, you know, and there are all kinds of interesting diagrams out there about how uh, these perspectives relate to each other. For me, it's as simple as this. It's a laddering up of the capabilities. You have financial goals that we want to achieve. In order to do those, we're gonna drive certain customer behaviors and actions. And in order to do that, we have to have internal processes that enable us to do that. And by the way, we have to have people who are capable of doing that, right? So we need to measure uh, across the board, how are we doing across those different perspectives? And that's really what the whole balanced scorecard is about. So I've already kind of given you a sense of what the objective of the balanced scorecard is. Uh, and by the way, uh, one of the reasons we engage Data Meaning in this process, a great partner, uh, is because of their approach to sort of creating visually stimulating, relevant content that helps really keep people focused on the content and not so much on the mode, right, or the, or the, the, the tool. So, um, so as I mentioned, we were looking at per potentially purchasing a third-party tool. Instead, we, uh, we, we showed the organization through a series of store bo storyboarding that Dan and Marvin are going to go through that uh, convinced our organization that we can do this with, uh, with MicroStrategy. So with that, I'll hand it off to Dan, uh, who will demonstrate that for you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, so I wanted to talk through a little bit around our approach um, to building out this prototype along with what our future next steps are going to be and then I'm going to take you through a demo of the working prototype. So the first thing we decided to do you know, was invest in a prototype. So the question was third party tool or you know, do it in house. Um, we basically said we're going to step up and we're going to prove to you that uh, we're more than capable of exceeding those expectations of those third party tools. Because Dan is not a big fan of moving data all over the place because I do it too much. <laughs> um, we've done this twice before with great success to build uh, business and leadership um, buy in. But the question is can we start to build them faster? Okay. Uh, so we did our first prototype in 2012, and it took us 10 weeks to do. Um, this prototype that you're going to see today took us only five weeks to build. Okay. Um, and then the other challenge is, can we build the prototype so that the majority of the development work can be reused in the final product? So the version that we built in 10 weeks in 2012 was completely thrown away, which to some degree is not bad because that 2012 version is the DC mobile app that Brian mentioned at our keynote at the keynote this morning. So that is our number one iPad application. We built that prototype. The business actually built a video with the prototype with our DC supervisors going around the DC engaging with their associates. We came back about six months later and we built a kick butt iPad application on, on MicroStrategy. So, um, not to knock the 10 weeks, but obviously we would like to reuse as much uh, of the build work as we can. The, the next thing is leveraging storyboarding. So this is something we've done three times before, and we're getting better each time. Uh, I'm becoming more and more a fan of it. It's not something that uh, I think a lot of BI folks are strong at. So that, um, that leads into why we selected to partner with Data Meaning. So after attending multiple worlds, looking at their presentations, 
hearing their approach to storyboarding along with their approach to uh, build was something that I was interested in uh, working with them on. So um, it's the quickest way really to get concepts in front of the business and the leadership. So uh, we used the storyboarding that we built um, over the five week period. We shared four times in three weeks to our executive team and it really helped gain feedback, alignment, confidence, trust from them. Uh, okay. Um, ultimately, we had a lot of drama related to this balance scorecard. You know, use a tool, not use a tool. And once we um, actually started to materialize our thoughts in the storyboard and socializing it, all of that drama calmed down. We started really then getting into how do we want it to function. Okay. Um, building a working prototype. So after the storyboarding. We went out and we built the prototype, and again, this gets used to uh, really learn and understand the user experience. And I mentioned the, the socialization with the executives in this example, but it's, it's helpful in all areas. So as an example, the working prototype for the DC was used um, to make a video and really end up um, sponsoring the project that we did the following year. So um, I'm a fan of both of these techniques, the timing, um, you know, of, of when you put it on the shelf and go back to, to uh, actually work on it. Our hope is that we're going to start doing the, the final build um, you know, in the coming months. Okay? So next steps are uh, we're looking to update the prototype to connect to our, our production data, okay? um, continue to socialize with the executives, and ultimately refine the storyboard, uh, refine the design, and complete a production build. Okay? So I'm going to try to transition over to the live app. Okay, so this is the fun part. Um, and, and I have to say that the storyboard that was designed is exactly <laughs> what this looks like. So this is the app as it uh, exists today in a prototype state. Um, we actually have it in-house uh, so that we can continue to socialize and share it. But um, the first thing I want to call out is just quickly walk through the top header bar. So you see this a lot you know, in the concepts. but. You know, we have the PetSmart logo, logo, we have the page that you're on, we have the three bar list that Marvin's going <coughs> to explain more of the science around how to design um, for mobile and for screen consumption. Um, we've got a refresh button, the annotate and share info icon, so, so pretty common stuff at the header level. Okay. Um, we show our vision line. Here's the perspectives that Brian mentioned. So. We have learning and growth, processes, customer, financial, ultimately at the top driving you know, our business forward. And then what we see here on the map is uh, 13 strategic objectives that all but one are masked out. <laughs> um, and again, this was data that we just mocked up. You know, I spent a week working, collecting all of the uh, different types of data. So what we're looking at is strategy map with the objectives listed, with some color-coded thresholding, okay? Anything to add? So, the, the idea then is you've got some interactivity. So we've got, we've got measures, measure and initiative alerts here that you can tap and navigate to, or you can tap on an objective and dive into an objective. So I'm gonna go into efficient supply chain. See if the demo curse doesn't bite. Okay, so what you're seeing here is the object objectives detail screen. Uh, we have, I'm looking at the out of stock rate. So supply chain is all about, you know, products and balancing the cost of inventory versus, um, you know, customer satisfaction and our customers having the products that they want to purchase. Uh, we've got a simple toggle between the measures and the initiatives. So this is where things start to connect together. So we have an objective, 
We have measures that are measuring the performance of that objective, and then we have the initiatives or the projects ultimately that are driving the improvement of the business. So, you know, this is just a simple panel with the radio buttons, and then you can tap on an initiative that has three projects on the right hand side. And I've teed this up to have the out of stocks be in red. So you look at the efficient supply chain, you see that it's red on the map, you come in, you can analyze how are the projects doing underneath efficient supply chain. Okay, and also how are the measures doing very quickly. Okay, and then what we did, we did was we want to do transaction services and create the ability to do action items and comments. So the lower section, I'm just going to demo the add addition of a action item. Um, and I selected the inventory optimization and I'm going to do, you know, project assistance. And while you're doing that, Dan, I'll just say that unfortunately the, the colors aren't completely coming through. Um, that, there it is. Okay, now that looks okay. a little bit better. That was, that's quick time. It actually looks fine on the app. Okay, so some simple commentary, uh, selection of some dates, you know, when is this due next week, okay, and assignment of an owner, so fill V, and you're going to hit save, and it's going to write that back as an action item, okay. So this is where we're incorporating transaction services. We're, we're actually big fans of transaction services and getting better at it all the time. If we have opportunity to continue to refine this workflow. Um, so now we've got an action item that's going to generate an alert on the strategy front page. Okay. So if I go back to the strategy map, this, if you can see it a little bit better, is going to increment uh, the number of action items that we have behind the scenes. And then you can drill into those and review them as well. So. Now what we're going to do is this is going to drill into all the objectives on that row for internal processes, okay? And you've got a quick summary of, you know, how things are doing. And again, you've got the concept of measures and initiatives, okay? And I could actually add an action item or add a comment on this screen as well. So I'm going to add a comment under inventory optimization. This is the coolest app ever. Help me out. <laughs> I'm going to blame it on the, the dongle. Murphy's there, Law. Murphy's <laughs> Law. Done. I knew it was going to. No, I should have typed it out. Oh, there we go. Quick test here. So you, you get the idea. So again, it's, it's back to um, building out something functional, getting that feedback, OK? Both from a storyboard concept as well as a final build. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of these processes and this was a good example and I knew it would work because you know we partnered with with a, a strong partner that then you know built the credibility for BI and as Brian mentioned with the, with the new executive staff um, we've been very successful on a number of fronts since they've come in so I thought I think that the expectations were not as high, you know, they didn't have as high of an opinion of our capability, and a lot of what we've been providing has been very innovative for them. So they didn't have any experience from mobile BI, and we've been able to bring that to the table, and now we're getting leverage and usage on that. Okay. So I'm going to transition to Marvin. Thank you very much. So they say that the, uh, the sweet spot for pace, speaking pace, is about 150 words a minute. So I'm just going to have to ask you guys to keep up with me because I'm probably going to be running about 200 to 250. A lot of information that I need to get out and I want to make sure that you get it before you leave for lunch. A um, couple of things that I would say is please do stop by afterwards to talk to Dan so that he could show you a live demo of the application. Unfortunately, the colors weren't coming through because of the BGA dongle. 
uh, everything looks perfectly fine, but I really do want you guys to get that experience yourself because there was a lot that was missing there from a color's perspective. It does affect things. All right, so prepare to hear something new, okay? Um, the reason that's important is because over the last 10 years, we've learned more about the way that the brain processes information, about the way that the brain stores information than we have in our entire lifetime as human beings. Now, the reason that's important is because a lot of those studies, you see at Data Meeting, we actually have a division that focuses strictly on cognitive ergonomics. In other words, the way that the brain works and process information, so on and so forth. And so what we're gonna do is we don't have enough time, but we will try to touch on at least three studies, okay, that talk about sort of the way that the, main, the mind works. And then we're gonna relate those studies back to the design of this application of PetSmart so that you can see how that, that understanding of the mind influenced our design. <clears throat> First study we will reference, Nielsen Usability Tests and Eye Tracking Study. This was actually a study that was done at the University of Stanford. Okay, the purpose of the study was to understand the differences between the way that we consume information on print versus web. And just for the purposes of this conversation, this presentation, let's just say that web is synonymous with everything outside of print. So it could be mobile, it could be a monitor, it could be whatever it may be. So the general findings, obviously there's a lot more. Uh, if you go to, I think it's the Oxford Journal has published this study. If you go there, you'll, you'll see that it's probably a 100, 200 page document. But let me summarize some very important key points there, okay? In web, users read centra left to right. In print, we read from left to right. Obviously, I'm confining this to the United States, of course. Um, in other countries, it, it changes. Um, in web, 79% of the control group that was scanned for that, for that study, um, they scan a lot more than you would scan when you speed read in print. Now, out of those who did read the entire content on that web page, they only absorbed 75% of the information that they read. And here's another point, which obviously you guys already know, uh, reading from a monitor increases eye strain and fatigue. Now, why is that important? Is because here's one of the major conclusions from that study, okay? In web versus print, we actually read, 20, we consume information at a rate of 25% less than we do in print. So what does that tell us? That tells us that if you've ever built an application and maybe you didn't get as much adoption as you thought that you would, because you started on an uphill battle. And so the next studies that we're gonna go through will talk about what we did in order to level that playing field. All right, so now we know that we're starting on an uphill battle. What we need to do is we need to have an application that can actually allow users to consume information a lot faster than they would in print. So something as simple as decreasing cognitive burden. What that means is cognitive burden is basically the, the burden that it takes for us to consume information. So the way that we can do that is by leveraging the experiences that users have from other applications. So you want to leverage as much of the quote unquote elements slash icons, functions, so on and so forth, that people are already using in other applications, whether it be Microsoft Outlook, whether it be Facebook, whether it be Google, but you get the idea. So here's something as simple as a navigation menu. There's an icon. Most of you are familiar with this icon. And so that information will transfer onto this application so that when they log into the PetSmart Norton Kaplan Balance Scorecard application, they know, boom, if I need to go somewhere else, this is where I'm going to do it. Not only that, but it's on the left-hand side. Guess what? We've, did, we've done some studies as well that show that the majority of applications in the U.S. do have those navigations on the left versus the right. Why? Again, going back to the science, we read centra left to right, not centra right left. Okay? Something as simple as that. All right, next study, proceeding in depth. This is a study that you can find in the Oxford Journal as well. Study deals with all depth perception mechanisms. And uh, one of the major things that we want to point out about this study, is it's much more extensive, okay? But one of the major things that we wanted to point out here is the way, it talks about the way that we interpret objects and we look at dimensionality. In other words, we actually see, believe it or not, in 2D. All right, so the way that it works is our eyes, the left eye and the right eye, hopefully you have both, um, they're taking snapshots, 2D snapshots, every single second. Obviously, it's very, very fast. Now, that information basically comes into the visual cortex and it gets interpreted, and then it gets transposed. Those two images get transposed on top of each other, and a little bit more information is sort of filled in, and that's how we have 
That's how we know where the object is and sort of the, the idea of perception and depth. Now, why is that important? Because the general gist of it is, is it actually takes the mind longer to consume 3D versus 2D objects. So how does that play into the design? Simple. We went to a flat design. So the idea of bezels, drop shadows, anything that would give dimensionality to that layout, guess what? It's going to slow the user down from reading that information. So something as simple as a flat design for your mobile devices okay, um, is going to help you out. Okay. The other thing is, too, so here's another study. Wait. Yeah, that's fine. All right, study number three. We're doing good on time, so this is great. Storage capacity of short-term memory. Now, you guys are familiar with technology, so you know that on a computer we have a hard drive and then we've got RAM. Guess what? The mind is very, very similar. The mind has something that's called the working set. The working set is something that we store in memory while we're working through a problem or while we're reading something. Now, what this study shows is that the working set can really own only hold no more than three, everywhere, anywhere between three to five pieces of information at exactly the same time. Okay? So, what does that mean for the application? Well, what that means is, guess what? As much as your executives tell you, give me a pie here and a graph there and then all this other stuff there, it doesn't matter because they're not going to be able to consume it at exactly the same time. The mind is only going to be able to take a snapshot of this and grab all of this at once. Take a snapshot of this and grab all of that at once. So what you want to do is you want to group important pieces of information and limit them to, to no more than five. For example, you have your top KPIs. Guess what? If you put eight up there, they can't consume it all anyways. You're going to have to scroll. So another thing that you want to do that you could sort of uh, do for that is you want to do something that's called in the design space progressive disclosure. What that means is you progressively reveal information as it becomes necessary. And there's a lot of nuances to this. See us afterwards. Come see Corinne. She's actually the, uh, the uh, COE of design in our division. <clears throat> and one of the things that you'll see here, so for example, if you notice when we were going through the live demo, we had a comment section, right? Um, and here are the action items. Now, you see many applications where you can actually have that transaction window right here. You can still view these. Guess what? It's two different types of processing. One of them, you're actually processing information. That's more the BI side of the house. The other one, you're actually entering a comment, which is actually a different type of process. So the way that we did it is we actually did a progressive disclosure here because at the end of the day, the, the user is not going to be able to consume all of those pieces of information at exactly the same time anyways. We're doing good. This is the end. <laughs> so um, I thought I might put a little bit of a twist to this and give you guys an analogy because I think that this is very, very relevant for us to understand. Um, and it kind of goes in line. It'll play well with everything that we just talked about. <clears throat> you guys are familiar. How many of you are familiar with the tipping point for Malcolm Gladwell? So you'll appreciate this. When you read that book, you read the story about the man who reinvented spaghetti. Right? This was Moskowitz. Basically, this story goes back to the 70s, 80s. Campbell's had, they still have, uh, spaghetti sauce called Prego. Prego just could not compete with Ragu. <laughs> so there was the battle of the sauces, right? And so <laughs> Campbell's brought in this guy, Moskowitz, and they said, listen, we need, a help. We need your help so that we can identify what it is that we're doing wrong so that we can actually competitively compete with Ragu. And so what Moskowitz did is he worked with Campbell's to create 45 different variations of that spaghetti sauce. And then they took that show on the road and did consumer taste tests. And this is what they found. He came back to Campbell's and Moscow had said, a third of your people like it plain. A third like it spicy. And here was the kicker that Campbell's didn't know. The other third like it extra chunky. So what did they do? His advice to them was build a line that's extra chunky. Over the next 10 years, they made over $600 million on that one line alone. So what's the conclusion here? What's the gist of the story? Campbell's had done surveys before to ask their people what they wanted. But 
those extra chunky words were just not coming out in those responses. In other words, your users, and now let's relate it back to the application because this is exactly what's happening. Your user's not gonna come and tell you, can you please decrease the cognitive burden on my application? <laughs> can you please apply some progressive disclosure to this one section of it? They don't, they don't know that. And so the gist of the story is, is that your users and human beings in general, we don't have the ability to articulate what we want, not fully, at least. And so, what do we do for that? Well, we talked about what's next. For example, one of the things that we're gonna be doing next with the PetSmart application is we're building a notification that's gonna be going out to mobile users, saying, hey, we haven't seen you in five days because you haven't logged into the system. Come back and log in. Something as simple as that. We're also going to be building in um, surveys into the application so that we could start receiving that feedback. In other words, it's not enough for you to design your application. You have to actually go back out there and get the feedback from your users, but also put some context around it because that's what we learned with Moskowitz. They had already done the surveys. They had already done those questions, but he put some context around it so that they could taste and be like, oh, yeah, 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 that, that's what I want. They didn't say extra chunky. They just pointed to which version they wanted. So we would recommend the same thing. When you release an application, isn't it going to be important for content? Serve up several different versions of it and do a survey. Ask them which one they like the most. Because again, they're not going to be able to tell you exactly how to lay it out. But if you give them different samples and different variations, they will be able to tell you out of those three, out of those four, which one they like the best. Finally, let me just put on my salesman's hat for a moment here. I'd say partner with data me. Let us be your Moskowitz. And uh, that's all I have. I'd say, finally, you know, towards the end, if you do have any questions, please feel free to sit with us at lunch. <laughs> Number one, come find us, because uh, I know that you guys want to go there. Um, and then we also have John Kim, our VP of Professional Services. If you have any questions, he'd be uh, able to answer those. And also, Corinne is here. Um, she is our COE of Design. Like I said, we have a division for user experience, cognitive or phenomenal, and she's going to be the one that's going to be able to answer a lot of those questions. So uh, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. And uh, enjoy lunch.